I want you to stand for a second. Give, in just a second, I'll tell you stand. Um, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find somebody, and I want you, well, two people. You need to find two people. And say, um, I either like to go to the same place over and over on vacation, you know, and just like learn all about it, or I, I like to go different places, okay? So do that. Find two people and tell them that. And don't do the person necessarily next to you. Find somebody else, all right? All right, all right, great job. Thank you, everybody. This is awesome. I love to hear you guys talking and having fun. You can continue those conversations later and uh, be able to, to, to just say, hey, I didn't know that about you. I'll tell you what was really cool. Um, it was about 50-50, like half said, no, I like to go to a new place all the time. The other half said, no, I like to go to the same place. What was really fun is to meet a couple that was married, and they were opposites, right? That's always fun. So um, I personally, I'm a person, I just, I like to go to new places all the time. I like new things. I don't sit in the same seats. I try to do like, I like change um, in that respect. Not all change, but I like that kind of change. But here's something I've discovered, and maybe you have too. You might have gone to a theme park or like a national park or a tourist destination many, many, many times, and you thought, man, I know everything about this, and then you, just, you discover something new, and you're like, I didn't know that. That's totally new, and it's a new experience for you. And, and to really get to know an area, I think it takes more than a day or two. Because you can see a lot of it in a day, right? You can do the day tour. But then to get to know it really well, it takes days. It, it could even take years. And that's how it is with God's Word. Like when I discovered or considered uh, Jonah as the summer series... I knew there'd be some great content for us, but I don't know about you, but I've just been finding things. I've read Jonah many times, and I'm finding new things, new stuff, so much more than I expected. And that's the power and the beauty of God's Word. It's rich with new insights and blessings every time that we read it or study it or meditate on it. Well, we've arrived at the final chapter of Jonah. And we're going to cover it both this week and next. And some of the things you'll hear in today's message, you're actually going to hear the same kinds of things in next week's message. And again, that's intentional. Um, I don't know about you, but I need to hear things more than once, right? So throughout the whole series, there have been themes that have been popping up over and over again. But before we read today's text, let's just do a really quick summary of, of where we've been. So God instructed Jonah, he said, I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to tell the people that they need to stop their evil ways and turn to me. Jonah said, not interested, went the opposite direction, and he went uh, on a boat. And so God said, fine, and God sent a storm. Um, then Jonah was thrown overboard to cause the storm to stop. God provided a huge fish that swallowed Jonah. He was in that fish for three days. And finally, God directed the fish towards Nineveh. The fish threw Jonah up. Jonah made the journey to Nineveh. He very reluctantly gave God's message to the people. And amazingly, they all said, okay, we repent and we're going to turn to God. So we're going to join uh, the story in progress, if you will. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 4, but I just want to back up and grab verse, three, or verse 10 from, from chapter 3 first. So the people all turned to God. Chapter 3, verse 10. God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Relent and repent actually have very similar meanings. They, they both mean to turn away or to do a 180-degree turnaround. So the people, they, they repented. They, they turned away from the evil they were doing, and they turned to God. And God turned away from the promised uh, destruction and turned toward mercy. Relent and repent. This is always God's heart. This is God's heart. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord isn't really slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. God wants to give mercy to Jonah, to the Ninevites, 
to you, to your neighbor, to everyone. And God used Jonah to communicate his message, this opportunity to the people, and they were saved. And Jonah, he hated it. Picking up in chapter 4, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord asked, Is it right for you to be angry? Well, Jonah is mad. He is really upset. And the reason for his anger leads us to an important question. What kind of God is God anyway? What kind of God are you anyway? You see, ancient people believed their gods were vindictive and brutal and unforgiving. But Jonah knew that the only true God, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, he is different. In fact, Jonah quotes God's own self-description that he gives to Moses in Exodus chapter 34. God, it says this in in chapter 34, verse 6, the Lord passed in front of him, Moses, and he proclaimed. So this is God's own words. The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, uh, is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Sounds like exactly what Jonah said. God is gracious and compassionate. Picture somebody that is is a, a strong person and they're bending down in kindness to help someone who is vulnerable. That's the picture here. God is gracious and compassionate. God is slow to anger. Now, one way that um, they tell you, you know, if you're getting angry, find yourself getting angry, then here's what you need to do. Just slowly count to 10, right? Take some deep breaths, count to 10. Well, God's God's kindness, God's patience toward us is not measured in seconds. It's measured in years. Loving. Think of marriage vows. When someone promises to be faithful and to seek the good of their spouse until death. Well, God loves you. God loves you to death, literally. He loves us so much that he gave his life so we could have life. There is no greater love. God relents from sending disaster. Again, God desires for hearts to be softened and to return to him. He doesn't want disaster to come on anyone. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, loving, doesn't send disaster. Those are admirable traits. But instead of celebrating them, Jonah sees them as weakness. He angrily uses them like almost as weapons against God. I knew you were gracious. (laughs) Somebody being mad about that? I knew you were gracious. I knew you were compassionate. Man, I'm so frustrated because you're slow to anger. I hate that you're so loving. And I'm mad that you will not send disaster. But I think we have to understand what Jonah is doing. I think he is simply recognizing the tension between justice and mercy. Between God's truth and God's grace. Jonah can't reconcile them. But God can. Jonah loves God's mercy towards him. Like Jonah is thrilled that God is gracious to him, that he shows compassion to him, that he is slow to get angry with him even though he rebelled. He is thrilled that God demonstrates unjustified love towards him and doesn't send justified destruction against him. Jonah's gratitude is expressed in his first prayer, which he says when he's inside the huge fish that God provided to keep him from drowning. Let's read that. We read it a few weeks ago. Let's read it again. 
Chapter 2, starting in verse 5. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Death, right? Death. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Now, I don't know if you look in your Bible, whether that's digital or printed, um, you, you might think, wow, this sounds kind of like a psalm. And when you look in your Bible, it may actually be kind of formatted that way. Like when you're reading psalms, you know, they have like verses and stuff. That's what this looks like. This is Jonah being grateful, being thoughtful. And God does good things for Jonah, and he loves it. But when God does good things for his enemy, he hates it. Jonah hates God's mercy for the Ninevites. Jonah is furious that God is gracious to them, that God shows compassion towards them, that he is slow to get angry with them, because after all, they rebelled. Jonah is furious that God demonstrates unjustified love towards them and doesn't send justified destruction against them. Jonah wants God to be like the other, quote, gods. Vindictive, brutal, and unforgiving. Jonah's second prayer is totally different than his first prayer. In his second prayer, which we just read uh, a little bit earlier, he prayed to the Lord, Lord, please, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you were gracious and a compassionate God. You were slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, the one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Like, there's no poetry here. <laughs> he is just spewing out words in a temper tantrum. Like, you, you picture a kid just like, ah! He was really ticked off. Or an adult ticked off. Jonah is doing what many of us do. He's categorizing sin. He's determining that the sin of those people is much worse than his own or the sin of his own people. Now, obviously, the physical or emotional or relational or financial consequences of sin can vary, but the spiritual results are always the same. All sin separates us from God. Jonah is just plain arrogant. Inside the fish, he says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for him. Again, this, uh, for them. Again, this is part of that poetic time. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation is from the Lord. I don't have idols, Jonah says. But he was very obviously clinging to at least two of them, his self-love and his nationalism. Now, appropriate self-love isn't a bad thing. I mean, after all, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? We need to love ourselves appropriately. Jonah certainly loved himself, but he didn't love his neighbor. What about us? What about me? An appropriate love for country is not a bad thing. Let's be grateful for, what, for our nation, but let's avoid religious nationalism. Remember, we are citizens of heaven first, and we want as many people to be citizens of heaven as possible. See, Jonah believed salvation was only for his people group. He wanted God to limit it just to him and his group. Jonah is essentially saying, you know, what's good for me, well, that's too good for them. About a week ago, I discovered a book by Tim Keller called Rediscovering Jonah. You might want to pick up a copy. It's, I got it from the library. It's a really good book. And it's based on a series of three different uh, messages, um, three different message series that Tim Keller did uh, in three different decades as they walked through Jonah as a church. 
And let me just read an excerpt um, talking specifically about this passage from the book. In chapter 2, verse 8, Jonah speaks of pagan idolaters and says, Those clinging to empty, empty idols forfeit the grace that is theirs. For a moment he understands. He is saying, as it were, I see now that since salvation is of the Lord, it is only by free grace and mercy alone, and there is no one different. The morally good people and the wicked pagans, the grace of God is as much theirs as it is ours. We are all undeserving, but we can all receive it. Had he yet grasped this idea fully, it would have purged him of the self-righteousness that reasserted itself after Nineveh was spared. It would have demoted his love for country from an ultimate thing to a good thing. And so his disappointment in chapter 4 would not have erupted into suicidal despair. The last words we have recorded of Jonah in the book are paraphrased this way in the message paraphrase. It says, God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. Jonah is saying in words what he's already said in his actions. I would rather die than see my enemies turn to God and be forgiven. And that's when Jonah asks, or when God asks Jonah this question. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? Today's message is not about suffering, but I think there is a correlation And we understandably wonder about suffering that seems unfair or why God didn't prevent something from happening. We can get frustrated and angry with God. And and I believe that's one of the reasons why God gives us so many of the Psalms, to just help us understand this is a painful struggle. This life is. And and God understands and, and is willing to hear those complaints, to understand that we have these concerns and these questions. Why is there suffering? But there's a very important distinction here. Jonah is angry for the exact opposite reason. Jonah is furious because God prevented suffering. Jonah wants to see the Ninevites punished, for them to to have justice, to experience justice for the evil that they've done. And anyone in Israel would be in 100% agreement with him. The Ninevites have done horrible things. Why would God give them grace? Jonah was mad because he thought God was making it too easy for sinners to be forgiven and experience a right relationship with God. Now contrast that with Jesus. Jesus got angry at those who made it harder for people to be in a right relationship with God. Those with religious authority who focused on legalistic rules that kept people from authentic faith. Jesus got angry at the money changers in the temple who were making exorbitant, ridiculous, unfair amounts of profit rather than helping people connect with God in prayer, in worship, and in sacrifice. And Jesus angrily drove them out of the temple because they were keeping people from God. They were making it harder for people to be in a relationship with God huge contrast. Still like Jonah, we we may get upset about God's lack of justice in our eyes, but we also need to see this bigger picture. Remember this reality. God personally experienced injustice on our behalf. Like Jonah, we have a a sense that wrong needs to be punished. That that actually comes from God, that, that sense of right and wrong. And punishment does happen. But it's unjust because the one who is innocent, Jesus, is punished. And the one who is guilty, me, you, each of us, we can be forgiven. And for that, we should be eternally grateful. First Peter 3.18 says this, Christ died or, sorry, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, All have sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, in his grace, 
freely makes us right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Here's the bottom line. Justice for sinning means we would be separated from God forever. Injustice means we get to spend eternity with God. But the only way that can happen is for Jesus to give his life on the cross. Jonah didn't want God's grace for those who had hurt his own people and who honestly had proudly gone against God and God's principles in the process. That might resonate with us. And again, Jonah wanted forgiveness for him, but he wanted justice for them. Jonah allowed difficult circumstances to harden his heart. Now, honestly, my heart can be hard too. It can be hard hard towards a, a person or a group who has hurt me or probably even more to, it can become hardened to a, a group or a person who has hurt a person or a group of people that I love. Our hearts can become hard, and honestly, we're not really interested in God's grace for certain groups of people because we think, well, they don't deserve it. Or maybe, maybe we don't, we don't allow God's grace for one person, the, the person we know best, ourselves. Or maybe your heart resists God because you've asked him to do something and he hasn't. Maybe your heart is hard because God has asked you to do something and you haven't. Our hearts can can become hardened for many reasons. Breakthrough happens. Breakthrough begins when we ask God to change us. Now that change doesn't usually happen immediately. There's there's the, the salvation part, this change of our relationship with God that can be more immediate. But the change deep in our hearts of us becoming more like Jesus is not an instantaneous thing. It is something that happens over time. In fact, it's a lifelong journey. And as you journey on life, God will walk with you. So change doesn't happen immediately, but it does begin with surrender. And so we're going to sing a song that really challenges us, asking God to soften our heart to increase our faith. And as we take our next step with Jesus, as you take your next step with Jesus, you'll experience more, more of what God desires for you and what he desires for the people around you. Would you stand as we pray? God, I just stand before you and admit that there are parts of my heart that are kind of crusty and hard and insensitive. I assume that everyone would feel the same. God, it's our desire to have you soften our hearts. To help us to see people the way that you do. To be grateful for the grace and mercy that you've extended to us and for us to want others, to tell others that they can experience your grace and mercy as well. God, help us to be more like Jesus. And whatever that next step of faith that you want us to take is, help us to do that courageously, boldly, with the knowledge that you walk with us.
And in those times when we can't walk, you carry us. Thank you for being a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and and one who does not want disaster to fall on anyone, but wants everyone to come to faith in Jesus. We love you. Thank you for loving us and demonstrating it. We pray in the name of Jesus.